from wherever you're joining us. Welcome to this HLPF side event, Governance of Disasters Risk Reduction and Resilience to Boost the Delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. This virtual meeting has been organized by the University of North Carolina in the United States, the University of Mauritius, University College London, and the University of Ghana, and hosted today by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future. And I'm Charles Newhan, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum. For those of you unfamiliar with the Stakeholder Forum, we are an international not-for-profit NGO that has, for over 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. Stakeholder Forum seeks to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and the international fora where discussions are made in their name. Without delay, we'll begin uh, the webinar. I just would like to say a couple quick things about uh, uh, housekeeping, so to speak. Uh, if you wish to uh, pose a question, uh, please put it in the uh, Q&A box. I believe that is an option. Uh, if you wish to communicate with each other or to add documents or links for, uh, to be shared with the rest of the participants, please use the chat box for that. Now on to our speakers. Uh, Monica Boham is a Ghanaian, Ghanaian uh, pardon me, diplomat with over 15 years experience in diplomacy and international relations. She has been a minister counsel at the permanent mission of Ghana to the United Nations in New York since October 2017, where her duties include ensuring active participation of her country in UN activities bordering on ECOSOC meetings, on economic and finance matters, and related sustainable development topics. From 2015 to 2017, Mrs. Boham served as policy advisor at the uh, multilateral and Middle East desks of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of Ghana. She, has also, uh, she was also the head of finance and administration at the Embassy of Ghana in Cairo, Egypt from 2010 to 2014. Monica is passionate about accelerating efforts in the implementation of the SDGs, especially creating partnerships and finding sustainable financing uh, for the achievement of the sustainable development while leaving no one behind, especially in the era of COVID-19. Welcome, Mrs. Boham. Uh, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. And I would also like to welcome all of you to today's workshop. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all wherever you are. The governance of disaster risk reduction and resilience has become increasingly important for wherever you are in the world today. The temperatures in Canada last week and even here in New York were a real wake up call to the changes going on everywhere due to climate changes. The number of weather related hazards such as droughts, floods and heat waves has tripled and the frequency and intensity are expected to continue increasing, adding greater pressure on resource availability. Those risks are amplified by climate variability and change and made more complex by changing patterns of human activity. Indeed, by 2030, there could be 325 million people exposed to the full range of natural hazards and climate extremes. So this side event is very relevant as it covers two cross-cutting issues for the sustainable development goals, addressing disasters and creating and strengthening partnerships involving stakeholders. It also seeks to remind those here today that next year is an important year for the UN Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction with a seventh session of the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction being held in May next year in Bali, Indonesia. It is therefore only appropriate that we have events on this subject as part of this year's HLPF. We have four panelists and two respondents. Let me quickly introduce the panelists first, and I'll then introduce the respondents after we have heard from the panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Catalina Spataru. She's a professor in global energy and resources, the head and scientific director of Islands Research Laboratory 
at the Bartlett, Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources, University College London. Catalina is a principal investigator and project lead for the Re-Energize Belmont Forum funded project focusing on the governance of disaster risk reduction and resilience to boost the sustainable development goals. Her expertise ranges from theoretical investigations to implementation research and practice in energy, environment, resource nexus, water, energy, land, food, materials, and then risk assessment and resilience, people behavior and response. Our second panelist will be Kristen Downs, who is on the PhD program at the Environmental Sciences and Engineering at the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina. Kristen's interest in water and sanitation issues um, includes working in the Peace Corps in Kenya and has since led to water and sanitation fieldwork in Mozambique and South Africa with UNC, UNICEF, and Engineers Without Borders. Kristen has been working on the Re-Energize project since the beginning of 2021. Her research focuses on modeling the risks, uncertainties, and economic implications associated with climate change impacts on waterborne disease as mediated by the service quality of water and sanitation infrastructure and its interactions with weather variability and extreme events. Our third panelist is Professor Man Manta Devi Nauber, PhD, and he's an associate professor and head of the civil engineering department at the Faculty of Engineering, University of Mauritius. She's a civil engineer by training. Her research has focused on the water sector with climate related disasters such as flood and drought being part of the local problems she has been researching. In doing this, she has built a local network with institutions concerned with the problems of flood and drought in the country. So um, after we hear from the uh, panelists, I'll go on to introduce our respondents. So um, I think we can move on. Wow, uh, so we have the discussion. So um, Dr. Catalina Spataro, if you could take the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Um, next slide. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so I'm going to give you an introduction to our project. Uh, we call it Re-Energize um, DR3. It's coming from Re-Energized Governance of Disaster Risk Reduction Resilience for Sustainable Development. Um, and we uh, plan a kickstart uh, for the global governance. Next one. Right. So uh, our consortia consists of a multidisciplinary team, uh, cross-disciplinary form of researchers from four continents and seven countries from UK, US, Qatar, Japan, Mauritius, Ghana, and Italy with a cumulative um, experience, person amount experience of 250. And we are funded by four research agencies from UK, US, Qatar, and Japan. And uh, what our project is doing is to address the simultaneous interactions between climate related natural disasters and development for effective disaster risk management, acknowledging the role of community involvement in disaster risk management planning, and the role of legal principles and institutions in um, reducing asymmetries in knowledge and power within a society. Next one. So what we did is we looked at the number of people affected by the disaster type for the period 1994 to 2013. And there were about 2.4 billion uh, of people affected by floods, followed by droughts and storms. And it is projected by 2030 that different parts of the world will warm up by 1.5 degrees Celsius, even up to 8 degrees Celsius in some of the parts. And this will cause more summer heat waves and warmer winters. Rainfall will increase by approximately 25%. Um, and the frequency and intensity of these of the cyclones and uh, related flooding will increase as well. 
So based on all this data and uh, our cumulative experience and expertise, we uh, prioritize floods, heat waves, and droughts part of the project. Next one. So in conditions of uh, post-normal science, where facts and indicators are uncertain and values are disputed, there is a need for a normative institutional approach involving diverse stakeholders and the ponderation of legal principles supported by uh, the nexus informed methodological approaches and use of combined approaches based on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. And in other words, we need to re-energize the governance. So the primary objective um, of our project is to come up with a scientific approach for adaptive disaster risk reduction and resilience governance based on a combination of numerical and social science approaches with, within the four packages. So we have diagnosis, research and development, application and synthesis, uh, each of these with different key functions and methods of work. The primary aim is to build an integrated interdisciplinary approach um, that includes a normative institution dimension with cross stakeholders and cross scale interactions by transforming qualitative and quantitative data into actionable insights for better disaster risk governance. And our focus is primary uh, to bring equity as a central to disaster risk reduction resilience governance and um, equitable DR3 involves complex data processes and stakeholders engage engagement. And two of the elements um, which play a particular major role in uh, DR3 implementation um, are one of them is um, ensuring an efficient exchange of information and data processes across stakeholders groups and participatory and equitable decision-making to influence the processes. And um, so the key aspect is the continuous engagement with stakeholders and building new, building new partnerships um, uh, part of this. Next one. So the different methods utilize across consortium partners inform and support each other. And the final product will be a toolbox um, by combination of quantitative methods, qualitative methods, and ontological approaches, which is values and principles. So the toolbox consists in different methods and tools, all interconnected. So in here, I simplified them in four interconnected main topics. Uh, one is the diagnosis and stakeholders processes. Uh, another one is social media data and data processing using the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Another one is resource nexus and climate change modeling scenarios. And another one is application to coastal cities and islands as case studies and the continuous interaction with stakeholders in different locations. So st starting with the screening of legislation, policy measures and governance arrangement mechanisms, we created first a diagnosis catalog. Then in parallel, we looked at the global agendas, SDGs, climate change, and I framework and so on. And we perform an analysis of the metrics to derive uh, um, uh, the indicators uh, for equity DR3. And then together with the catalog, we develop a balanced scorecard. In parallel, what we did is we put in place a process for stakeholders to derive information users. Um, and then we create a number of scenarios and to inform the resource nexus tool. We then have social media collections with, uh, uh, with uh, the tool and for data processing, for filtering approaches. Um, and then we have a sentiment analysis, which could inform stakeholders engagement as well as the specific application to case studies. Next one. So, so we do have a number of um, uh, innovative aspects and originality. And, um, and, and this originality consists in a number of elements. So first is the indicator scorecard and the expert licitation methods. Um, then is the artificial use of artificial intelligence for digital responses. Uh, which combines human intelligence and machine computing. And then we have a resource nexus and uh, the trade-offs between use of resources and the different climatic scenarios and demonstration of the scenarios. 
So the first step was first to assess the multi-disasters and multi-level governance in each of the seven locations. And we consider for that four pillars. Uh, the impact of climate change and disasters on economy, the national programs of development, the institutional structure and policy, and the guiding norms. Uh, from this diagnosis, we extracted the key general characteristics, the driving forces uh, behind the strategies for the athlete, and that has been done for different stages, for anticipation, assessment, prevention, pre uh, preparation, and response. Then we assess the government's arrangements, and then we consider different mechanisms and uh, path dependencies, uh, considering uh, different factors such as policy opportunities, and um, all of this information form the basis of the diagnosis catalog. This helps to derive the indicators, as well as helping the process of the stakeholders' engagement and um, developing a common set of uh, indicators for DR3, for cross-cultural comparison, while recognizing that indicators should be sensitive to local contextual conditions and temporal dimensions are among the challenges uh, which we face in our project. So UCL and UNC developed a balanced scorecard for this purpose, uh, which has differences and similarities in its approach. So the balanced scorecard originally uh, was developed as a multi-phase management tool. Uh, that can balance financial and non-financial measure, measures adopted by businesses, both in the short and long term, through a combination of key performance indicators and metrics split into four dimensions, finance customers, internal processes and learning and growth. So what we did in our teams, both teams adapted the four dimension uh, to define them as finance, process, beneficiary, and learning and innovation. And given the scorecard that is multidimensional and only some studies consider temporal aspects, our novel approach has defined the temporal time steps for all categories. So the time steps are different in each of them because um, at UCL we follow the UK integrated emergency management split, uh, which is split in the six rela uh, related phases of anticipation, assessment, prevention, and preparation to deal with pre-emergency elements, also response and recovery to deal with post-emergency elements, while UNC follow the period identified by TOPLU, which is response, recovery, mitigation, and preparedness. So to expand the notions of relations between these dimensions, we adapted the five nodes that nexus as well, water, energy, food, materials, and land, as a sub team under each of the category. And there is not a lot of people discussing equity in the context of the nexus or in the context of resilience. So this is another novel element of our research and recovery is still focused way more on indicators associated with infrastructure and physical loose. So again, uh, we identify the asymmetries and the gaps uh, which uh, challenge the four dimension of the environmental justice, the distribution, the recognition, the participation, and capability. Next one. So uh, in terms of the indicators and the scorecard, the, um, the approaches we took, so at UCL we derived a list of indicators for the balanced scorecard by drawing up on three major international frameworks, the SDGs, the Sendai framework, the climate change, and the UNDP. So while the UNC focus on UNDP, SDGs, and Sendai, so we focus both on academic and gray -like literature, including official uh, national documents, uh, as well as different tools. Um, so overall, UCL uh, came up with about 455 indicators across the four score card dimensions. Uh, UNC come up with 122. So for both teams, uh, most indicators were found in the categories of processes and beneficiaries. Uh, followed by finance and learning and innovation. So there is a need to advance the indicators for learning and innovation for, for, for both teams. So working together, we identify the indicators at the global level, especially those under the Sendai framework, which were not identified, um, how and where it has been measured in the UK and the US. And uh, as an example is, um, for example, the direct economic loss to cultural heritage damage or destroyed uh, attributed to disasters. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, Bull UK has an extensive list of indicators related to vulnerability and uh, um, deprivation, which have a potential to inform other governance levels and places. So we learn a lot from each other and uh, together we, um, we took different approaches and um, similarities we have also in our work so we can uh, prepare a scorecard which can be up applicable to as many as cases as possible. Next one. So um, the capacity of a government to prevent, understand and recover from the disaster risk in a way that advance the SDGs, the climate change adaptation mitigation and the Sendai framework depends upon effective monitoring, planning and coordination of resources and is underpinned by access to uh, appropriate technology and data. So for these frameworks to build up on each other and advance the fair processes and outcomes in their implementation, we uh, recommend that justice should be placed at the center and serve as the connection um, element between these agendas, as, as you see in this uh, figure, uh, especially when address addressing the trade-offs in the context of risk, resource allocation and vulnerability. Our balance scorecard develops a system of indices that measures equitable disaster risk reduction resilience in response to climate change issues connected to droughts, heat waves, and floods, considering the resource nexus and the following three agendas, the main agendas of climate change SDGs and Sendai framework. And the resource nexus approach has the potential to improve the indicators of the DR3 by supporting the metrics that take into account uh, the linkages between resources and management between pre and post disasters. So we split all these indicators according to different categories, uh, finance process, learning and inversion beneficiaries uh, by disaster phase as well to help define the key performance indicators under the balance scorecard. So we are going to apply and adapt uh, the next one. So we are going to apply and adapt the balance scorecard to various case studies. So through a mix of methods for the stakeholders engagement processes that we will combine um, scientific methods like policy delta and Q method and so on with um, its multiple rounds, we will create an opportunity to participants to react and assess different, uh, different viewpoints, which will help us map out the expert judgments and underlying the reasoning on complex DR3 issues. So our group communication is being structured by multiple surveys and rounds of discussions involving the panel of experts in different coastal cities and cluster of islands, as you can see here. We do have in our, uh, uh, in our team uh, uh, two, uh, we will focus primary uh, as a starting point in two um, uh, studies, uh, Accra in Ghana and Mauritius as an island, but we expand that by building up new partnerships um, to other coastal cities and other islands clusters. Next one. Kirsten. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so um, I'm Kristen, and I'll be sharing with you some of our work on disaster risk reduction and resilience in the US and the UK. Um, Kristen, sorry to interrupt, okay. but before you go on, um, okay. I wasn't sure whether Catalina was done. So let me just take from here and then you okay. can come in. So um, thank you, Catalina. Um, at this juncture, I wish, to, I wish to do something I should have done in the beginning, introduce our fourth um, panelist, Um, Dr. Yao Ajemambuafo, who is a research fellow at the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability Studies, University of Ghana. Um, Yao is a social ecologist with a PhD in sustainability science from the United Nations University Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability, Japan. Yao has been working in the fields of climate and ecosystem change assessment vulnerability and resilience in socio-ecological systems, food security, 
and disaster risk for sustainable development. Yao has been actively involved in global biodiversity and ecosystem research network and serving as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, so um, these are the panelists, um, and I have asked them to speak for seven to 10 minutes. Um, Catalina spoke a bit longer because she presented the, uh, the Re-Energize project. And the PowerPoint is being run by Felix Dodge from UNC. I would like us to also know that we can put our, our questions and, and comments in the chat as we go along. Um, and please mute um, yourself if you are not speaking. And as Charles has already mentioned earlier, and your video off if you are not speaking. And also finally put any comments in the chat box um, if um, anything excites you as um, the presentations are going on. I would like to um, now give the floor to Kristen and thank you for your patience, Kristen. You can have the floor now. Thank you. Uh, apologies for the mis uh, misunderstanding. Um, thank you very much, Monica. And um, I'll be sharing with you some of our work on disaster risk reduction and resilience in the US and the UK. Um, the US pr perspective is based on research by the UNC team, while that of the UK is based on work by the UCL team. Next slide, please. In the Re-Energize project as a whole, stakeholders are considered to be individuals, communities, social groups, or organizations that have a right or an interest in any decision or activity of an organization or system. Stakeholders in DR3 are many and should be in some way involved in making and implementing policies and decisions that affect disaster risk reduction and equitable resilience. They include, but are not limited to those who live in risk prone areas, people who live further away, but are uh, but indirectly suffer the consequences of such risks, settlers, businesses, small scale entrepreneurs, as well as consumers, the uh, media, environmentalists, national citizens, consultants, um, politicians and public servants from government officials in local and central government agencies, national and local NGOs, as well as community-based organizations, um, organizations, researchers, and donors, and the list can go on. Um, we consider the following questions. Who are potential beneficiaries? Who might be adversely affected by disasters? Who has existing rights? Who is likely to be voiceless? Who is likely to resent change and mobilize resistance against it? Who is responsible for intended plans? Who has money, skills, and key information? What are the stakeholders' needs? Um, UNC and UCL, like our other partner institutions, are adapting different approaches to stakeholder identification, selection, and engagement this year. After this year, we plan to review our results to form a cohesive approach between all our partner institutions based on our findings and best practices next year. The UNC team has been exploring what this looks like from a theoretical and practical standpoint in the context of disaster impacts. We've termed our stakeholder selection model the snow angel concept. This, this concept expands on the existing snowball approach for identifying stakeholders, which starts with a few defined stakeholders and asks them to identify new contacts. While this is helpful for researchers and requires little capacity, this me method can unintentionally limit the scope of included stakeholders. The, snake, the snow angel method for stakeholder prioritization then both recognizes the need to include a wide number of stakeholders while purposely sampling those that center with the, um, those that have power as well as those who are most impacted. As you can see on the image on the right, the outstretched rings of the snow angel depict how we seek to broaden the scope of stakeholders engaged. However, the snow angel method also recognizes that the further away from the center of the angel, the less engaged stakeholders tend to be on a particular issue. 
The center of the snow angel, which has more depth, represents stakeholders that have more knowledge and power or stakeholders who are more impacted by the um, by disaster policies. Overall, the snow angel method is an attempt to incorporate the need for broad stakeholder input while recognizing those who are most impacted or vulnerable, as well as those with um, with power who um, who all li likely have the deepest stake in issues at hand. At the bottom of the slide, there's a link to a YouTube video further explaining the snow angel concept if you're interested. Um, next slide. So what does this look like so far? Um, at UNC, our stakeholder identification and selection process has evolved over the last few months, but the UNC team has tried to be as intentional as possible in deciding who needs to be included and have tried to refer back to the core concepts behind the Snow Angel method. We focused on three levels, the US federal level, the state of North Carolina, and the city and surrounding region of Morrisehead City, which is located on the coast of North Carolina, where we're located. or we're broadly located in North Carolina. Our first step was to identify which stakeholder category should be included. We have a total list of 26, some of which are listed on the right hand side. We've identified stakeholder groups based on research and in consultation with our project partners. Use a combination of snowball sampling and criterion I sampling, we've created a list of stakeholder contacts at the national, state, and local level. While, and, um, while we want to maintain a broad list of stakeholders, we also want to ensure certain criteria are upheld, including that we have a robust representation of those who are from more vulnerable populations, women, people of color, and stakeholder groups traditionally with less power. Our actual engagement process inc has included so far a questionnaire and our first workshop meeting. Our, identified stakeholders were sent a questionnaire and asked about important impacts of, drud, of, of flood, drought, heat, and heat waves, as well as resources, questions about vulnerability, and different response mechanisms to disasters. We've so far had our first online workshop where we've built off from the questionnaire responses by gathering stakeholders in breakout rooms to discuss response and preparedness to um, three specific disasters um, we're focused as um, flooding, heat waves, and drought. For each of the three disasters, our discussion topics included identifying important impacts, effective disaster responses, um, financial resources for preparedness and response, gaps in governance for preparedness and response, who is vulnerable and why, um, what resources are available, and what financial and governance changes are needed to address gaps. So far, we, we, we invited about 100 people to participate and had 16 participants in our workshop, um, which is listed on the right, including seven state participants, participants, two local and seven national participants. Next slide, please. Upon reflecting on our May workshop, we found um, multiple aspects that worked well and those with room for improvement that we will take into account in our next two workshops later this year. What worked? Given the workshop was online due to COVID, we worked in smaller groups of about five to six people per group. This gave participants an opportunity to bounce off of each other's ideas and everyone had a chance to speak. We strategically picked these groups based on people's interests while ensuring a mix of stakeholders in each breakout session, both by governance level as well as stakeholder group. We also experimented with a range of um, engagement styles. We had an open discussion both in the large group and breakout rooms. We were able to use the chat. And then um, this picture on the right shows um, Google Jamboards. So this was a, an interesting way that we uh, asked participants to write out sticky notes with their responses. Um, this helped us document people's responses to each question and allowed people to see what others were saying. Um, as we went, we could categorize thoughts and responses on the go into groups and facilitators were able to quickly point out trends and expand on what the group was saying. Um, it also allowed us to rapidly get initial thoughts down and elaborate in the group dis discussion. And this gave it a nice option for people who um, may not want to speak during every question. 
Um, we also have room for improvement. We uh, asked a lot of information up front, particularly in the questionnaire, which we um, uh, theorize or which we hypothesize lowered our response rate and may have deterred people from wanting to participate in the workshop. Um, so we're adjusting when and how we ask for information going forward. We also found that we had limited involvement from stakeholders working at the national level. While we had um, folks representing local and state organizations um, had more, um, slightly more to contribute. So we're also continuing to reflect about how we can improve our um, information elicitation methods. Next slide, please. So now we're going to go across the pond and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methods that UCL is, is using. Um, to identify stakeholders and their needs, UCL is combining three purposeful sampling methods that will help us select individuals or groups that are knowledgeable or experienced in, the, in DR3 in different localities. Stakeholder needs and requirements represent views of the communities or at the business or oper enterprise operations level. So the UCL team further categorizes stakeholders into primary and secondary groups, depending on an assessment of whether they are immediately affected by or can immediately affect the system. The UCL team identifies stakeholders according to three criteria. Um, the criterion I method and three categories. So one of these, cat the first category is power. We define that as people who are directly or primary stakeholders or indirectly the secondary stakeholders manage the risks of flood, heat waves and droughts. And internal st stakeholders are groupings of people who operate entirely within the boundaries of the organization. Examples of these are administrators, nurses, food service personnel, housekeeping personnel, et cetera. There's also interface, interface stakeholders. And these are those who function both internally and externally in relation to the organization. The major categories of interface stakeholders include the board of directors and the medical staff. Exta external stakeholders fall into three categories in their relationship to the organization. They are those who put inputs into the organization, those who compete with the organization for resources, and those with a special interest in how the organization functions, such as the Chamber of Commerce of Economic Development Organizations. Our second criteria is urgency. People who are, and that is we define that as people who are directly or indirectly affected by GR3 decision making. This includes internal stakeholders, interface and external. Um, and our third criteria is legitimacy, those who are directly or indirectly affect, affect DR3 decision making. And again, with the three the same three subcategories. To guarantee diversity among invited stakeholders, UCL also considers multi-gender, multi-ethnicity, multi-scalar, and intersectoral aspects. UCL is using the snowball method to increase our list, so they are sampling people who know those that generally have similar characteristics, who in turn know people who have similar characteristics. This will help us to narrow down the range of, of variation and focus on similarities. Both the criterion I and snowball methods are useful for this purpose of narrowing down. For the last round of potential interviews, we will use purposeful random methods, um, which is useful to help us identify and expand on a range of differences. This combination of strategies is intended to maximize efficiency and validity as together they enhance our ability to compare and contrast stakeholder views. Thank you. Back to Monica. Thank you, Christine, for your presentation. Our third panelist is Professor Manta Devi Noble. Manta, you have seven to 10 minutes. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon to all of you. 
I'm Mantan Aubert. I'm uh, from the University of Mauritius, and I've been working in the field of hydrology for more than 25 years. So I'll be presenting today the stakeholders engagement process, which has been uh, set up in Mauritius in order to reduce the risk that a natural hazard turns eventually into a disaster. Next, please. Now, a brief about the island of Mauritius. The island of Mauritius is located in the Indian Ocean off the east coast of Madagascar. And uh, it consists of the mainland, as you can see here, the mainland, and a series of small uh, islands. Some of the islands are low-lying islands, and they, are, uh, they, are, they have a topography which is less than 10 meters and they are very much at risk to sea level rise. Whereas the mainland and another small island, which is Rodrigues, which is also shown on the map here, they are characterized by a central plateau, higher lands, surrounded by coastal plains. Now, Mauritius itself is uh, uh, used to be affected by natural disasters. Natural disasters is not completely new, and the island, as many islands in the world, have been under the threat of natural disasters for long. And for Mauritius, cyclones happens to be the most devastating natural uh, disaster, um, hazards that we have had. And uh, we have learned, we have set up a number of measures in Mauritius, and we have learned to live with cyclones and to reduce the risk and especially reduce the hazard of uh, losing lives. But landslide, floods, tsunamis, storm surge, tidal surges have all been part of the natural hazards which have affected the island. But what has really changed in the last few years, I would say in the last 10 years, is the intensity, the frequency, and the severity of natural, natural hazards. And because of that, the natural hazards can easily turn to disasters if they are not managed properly. So no wonder that the World Risk Index ranking has shown that Mauritius has been improving from 2018 to 2020, with the ranking changes changing from 16th position to 53rd position. But we are still in the category of countries which are at high risk to natural hazards. Now, the most recently, the most uh, uh, common or uh, threatening uh, natural hazards for Mauritius has been floods. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a map which has been published by the recent uh, newspaper, Defi Media, that's in June, 27th of June, 2021. As you can see for a small island, which has a surface area, a coverage of 2000 kilometers squared, we are already having 297 flood prone, prone zones, out of which 48 are at high risk uh, to floods. So where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, these days we can't say anything. Historical data doesn't help us. And we are seeing that sometimes the northeast, northern part of the island is severely affected by a torrential rain event, or at times, like recently in April this year, it was the southern part of the island which was severely affected, with rainfall occurring over uh, 400 millimeters recorded over a period of 12 hours, and at times around 150 millimeters being recorded over a period of two hours. So in terms of intensity, severity, the situation is getting bad. And uh, we've noted that the loss of lives in 2013 was the most deadly flood event that the island had recorded. This has happened because there has been changes, like I said, 150 millimeter being recorded in two hours. So high intensity, long duration rainfall, but also this has been coupled with development. So a recent study which has been undertaken using satellite imagery has shown that the built area, the impervious areas, 
have increased by 2.5% from 2005 to 2020. So this is an estimate, but still reflecting to a large extent the reality of that increase in the impervious area. Now, flood causes many damages, of course, but especially socioeconomic losses. So there has been damages to people's home, damages to infrastructure, loss of livelihoods, and unfortunately, in 2013, deadly loss of lives also. Now, following that problem in 2013, there has been major restructuring at institutional setup, especially to help better manage disasters which can occur because of flood. Next slide, please. So this is the setup that has been proposed and there has been the creation of one center, one dedicated center, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Center, NDRMC. So this center has uh, the, the mandate of, first of all, promoting disaster risk reduction for better uh, disaster management, if ever it happens, a disaster happens. So there is a continuous process. There is a uh, involvement at very high level, as you can see, cabinet level, very high decision-making level. And this trickles down through the ministry, the concerned ministry, which is presently the Ministry of Local Government and Disaster Risk Management. Through that, we have the connection with the center, there is the council, the center, and this goes down until it reaches the community. So this is under normal condition. There is a process, there is communication which takes place, and this uh, goes from high level decision making up to the community. And on the other side, which is bounded by the red dotted line, this is the setup which is activated during a disaster event during crisis situation. And here also, we have the involvement of almost all the stakeholders concerned, Mauritius being an island, it's relatively easier to identify stakeholders. And through this process, all the stakeholders which, can, which are involved, which have uh, a say in the whole process, are involved in that system. And again, there is constant, regular, constant feedback on ground to the center, to this setup, so that they can provide up-to-date information to the first responders, including the police force, including the health centers and NGOs like the Red Cross. Next slide, please. So as part of the stay, continuous stakeholders engagement and the OMC, has set up national committees which regroup government organization, the private sector, NGOs, and all other emergency services which are relevant. There are organization of workshops and sensitization campaigns which are regular. So for schools, for the business, for the communities, for many different organizations, including academia. There is also a program known as Community Disaster Response Program, whereby local inhabitants are empowered to take action during crisis events. And the NDRMC also organizes drills so that organization together with the communities, they know how to operate, where to go during a disaster event. And there's also finally the emergency alerts via mobile apps, which reach out to the general public. So quite a number of action has been taken by the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Center. And at the same time, other organizations such as academia, we also do our part. We have revised our syllabus in engineering so that we can train uh, the, new, the next generation of engineers into addressing issues related to stormwater and flood water management, and also addressing issues related to forecasting, like use of uh, modeling tools. So everybody is doing their own uh, contribution so that we can manage the system. Okay, so next slide, please. 
So with that, a reflection on stakeholders' engagement, we know that we do have our strength. So stakeholders' engagement process is in place. It will have to be updated as more and more organizations get involved. There is appropriate legislation to support disaster risk reduction and resilience in Mauritius. And more recently, a strategic and action plan to 2030 has been promoted and many organizations have defined their own action plan and they'll be reporting it at national level. The good thing is that after is disaster strikes causing lots of uh, disturbance in the process, the main services are often operational within three days or at most in one week. So we, these are some of, of our strength. Many people, many organizations are concerned here. But we also have our challenges. Now, during a crisis event, during a disaster event, there's a need to track people with reduced mobility very quickly so that we don't leave anyone behind. And this is something which is still being addressed and we would need support in that area. Second point to note is that disaster risk reduction is definitely a concern for of each and every one. And this is a culture that unfortunately has not been well been uh, inculcated in, in uh, all the inhabitants. So we still rely on first responders to a large extent and the self empowerment is yet to happen. The involvement of the NGOs are there, but there is potential for more active involvement. But in addition, I would say that stakeholders engagement is effective to a large extent, but at the same time, there is a need being a small island, the need for a holistic approach is very important for us and we require to consolidate preparedness to disasters. And another area where academia are currently involved is the review of design codes for buildings and infrastructure. This with the aim of building resilience. And to add that recently, the government also created another center more in line with management of floods, the Land Drainage Authority and major development are ongoing there to help reduce the risk that flood events will eventually change from a hazard to a disaster. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Manta. Um, I'd like to remind you to um, put your questions um, in the chat box. Um, we are looking forward to them. And our final panelist happens to be from my country, Ghana. Um, Dr. Yaojiman Buafu, you have the floor and um, you have seven to 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Minister uh, Chancellor. Thank you. So my name is Yao, and as you rightly said, I'm from the University of Ghana, and I work on the DR3 project. And I will give you some few important highlights about Ghana's own situation when it comes to disaster risk reduction and resilience. That's that's like good. So like many other countries, you know, Ghana is vulnerable to different kinds of disasters. You know, man-made as well as natural disasters, as well as hazards. So you can see from my graph here that, from my table here, that you know, in terms of natural disasters and man-made disasters, we have a number of them. For instance, insect and pest infestations are disasters that you know are more common in the rural part of the country. But you know, for the case of this particular project, you know, we are interested in disasters like hydrometeorological or climate-related disasters, which, in the context of what we are doing in Ghana now, we're looking at floods more specifically in the context of Ghana's flash flood, and then we're looking at drought. And if you look at the map here on your right, basically these are the parts of the country that are known to be extremely vulnerable to flooding incidents, mainly flash floods. So if you look at the northern part of the country or the upper part here, that is the northern region, there's, there's a number of areas here that you know annually are prone to floods. And if you come down to the center of the country where it is dominated by, let's say, um, Ashanti region, with the capital being Kumasi, you know, around this time of the year, June, June, are the, you know, the time we call the rainy season. And so annually, 
there's flooding incidents. Then we can look at our case study area, Accra. Accra here, basically, you know, being the most urbanized with about the most 70% urbanization within the country, is also the most prone to floods. You know, we look at uh, drought as more of a thing with the northern part of the country, basically because of also its proximity to the Sahara in terms of its so it's purely savanna vegetation. So these areas, you know, their proneness means that when it comes to decision making or governance or management of disasters, they tend to get a lot of attention. That's like great. So I decided to show you this picture to give you a sense of how you know the city looks like when there's flooding. So if you look at the first photo on your uh, upper left, that is Accra. This was 2016 when you know uh, the June floods. We say June floods because May, June are the times of the year that we usually have very you know high amount of rainfall within the you know the city of Accra and other cities in the southern part of Ghana. And when that happens, many communities turn into these sort of uh, major river bodies. Otherwise, typically these are roads. So if you look at the photo below, the photo below also gives you a sense of how most of the major highways get flooded when you have these times of the year. Fortunately, around this time, June this year, we haven't had this intensity of flooding because some of the actions that have been taken by you know, disaster man managers have probably helped. I'll go further. Apart from the flooding, I wanted to highlight that, you know, Ghana, once, let's say every 30 years, is prone to some amount of uh, earthquake. So more recently, I think about two years ago, you, you know, we had some tremors of 4.0 on the richer scale, which caused some scares in many neighborhoods of the city, even though it didn't do any damage. So basically, these are all interconnected when it comes to our vulnerability to many kinds of disasters, including floods. Next slide. And in trying to address or govern, you know, disaster in Ghana, we can look at what we call state level actors. And in Ghana, as a country that practices what we call the decentralization system, whereby, you know, at the, at the national, regional, and then the local level, some amount of power is given to different stakeholders. At the national level, some of the key stakeholders or state level actors that are involved in disaster risk reduction, I can look at issues of where we talk about the Ministry for Food and Agriculture, because, you know, when it comes to Ghana's Ministry for Food and Agriculture, you know, we look at many parts of the country where people are still involved in, I mean, agriculture, and most of these, you know, areas are also prone to flooding, especially in the northern part of the country. We can also look at the Ministry for Environment, and we also look at sanitation. That's also one ministry that basically also has a role to play when it comes to governance of disaster. There's a ministry for interior. That ministry is critical because, you know, critical agencies under the ministry like the, the National Fire Service, the uh, National Disaster Management Organization are critical to that. You know, if you move down to the regional level from the national level, these ministries or these agencies have their representatives at the regional level. So in Ghana, we have a system of governance where Again, beyond the central government, you know, in each of the major what we call regions. So we have 16 main regions, and each region also has a representative that deals with, that represents the different ministries. And under them also, there are different, you know, agencies that are supposed to provide direction when it comes to addressing, you know, different kinds of disasters with more emphasis on flood in Ghana. So at the regional level, it happens there. Then we can go to what we call the local level. So the local level is, is a, you know, is the smallest unit of the governance system in Ghana, whereby, so if you go to maybe the regional level, you can go further to a community within the region. So let's say, for instance, in Accra, Accra, greater Accra region is where we have, if you look at maybe a small community like Medina, it's also, you know, a district level, the people in that community can also send their, you know, issues or, you know, talk about disaster risk reduction at that level. And sometimes, funds are raised at different levels to support different kinds of governance or disaster risk, but much of the emphasis is on the national level in Ghana. Next slide. So beyond the non-state actors, we cannot also look at the, beyond the state actors, we can look at the non-state actors, because critically, what some of the studies that we are doing in Ghana has shown is that increasingly, because in Ghana, when it comes to disaster risk reduction, much of 
emphasis has been on what we call the reactionary approach instead of you know more like a pre pre precautionary approach or preparation. So we wait for disaster to occur, then we get a lot of you know stakeholders coming on board. And one of the areas that the non-state level stakeholders or actors coming on board is when there's a disaster or when there's flooding, we get a lot of support from you know the private sector. But you know, an international agency like the World Bank is maybe an exception here because the World Bank over the years has supported you know the Ghanaian government with different kinds of resources, like financial resources to for them to prepare, help us better prepare or plan for disasters in different parts of the city or different parts of the country. So they provide funds for the construction of gutters or for the cultivation of maybe greens along different parts of the city. And this is something that, you know, obviously is important because it helps us to reduce our vulnerability as well as deal with many others. Apart from the World Bank, obviously the USAID also is a very active player because the USAID through its support for climate change adaptation projects in the country has allowed you know many communities right in, to be able to you know get knowledge or be aware of how actions impact flooding. Then we can look at you know more like private sector engagement like uh, waste management companies which are contributing significantly to you know helping to address sanitation situation or waste management situation. That so also one example I can cite is that in the city of Accra, with a huge population as well as you know, changing consumption levels, there's an issue of plastic waste. So during the several times of the year, we have huge levels of volumes of plastic waste that are dumped into gutters. And so when it rains, it becomes easy for many of the gutters to get choked, and that also results in different kinds of flooding. At the local level, radio stations, religious bodies, or NGOs are also playing key roles in dealing with disaster risk reduction. Next slide. So generally, in terms of some of the key reflections, that is guiding the study or the case study in Accra, Accra, Ghana. What we are trying to do, or what we are trying, the question that we are trying to ask is that, so what type of assets are involved in the disaster risk reduction and resilience network in Ghana? It's a very important question because we want, that's how come the, you know, the slide before this one came up. We want to be able to see the kind of interaction that is occurring between these different kinds of assets and how strong or how weak these interactions are to be able to, see how we can propose more you know, viable interactions for it to happen. The second you know, question that we are trying to raise is that how are DR3 networks structured in relation to information, knowledge, you know, resource exchange, and trust for sustainable development? You know, if we situate you know, disaster risk reduction in the context of sustainable development, for instance, if you situate this whole Accra in the context of SDG 11, resilient cities, we cannot you know, afford to take any steps or provide any recommendations without integrating these together in, in that manner. So it's important for us to look at these questions. And in the next few few days, few weeks and months, uh, we've done a lot of stakeholder engagement and we are about to go to, done to do further analysis of our data to see how we can generate very relevant information to guide policy and decision making at the national, at the regional, as well as at the local level. So I believe these are my, you know, Insights for now. I'll be happy to answer our questions and provide you with some relevant insights. Thank you. Thank you, Yao. Um, to help our discussion, we have two excellent respondents. Our first will be Jeb Brugman. Jeb is a founding principal at Resilient Cities Catalyst. He's a strategist and innovation expert in the fields of business and development. Seven major corporations, local governments, and nonprofit organizations worldwide. Proud to this, he was a Resilient Solutions and Innovation Vice President at 100 Resilient Cities in 19, at 100 Resilient Cities, I beg your pardon. In 1990, he founded ICLEI, Local Government for Sustainability an international association of 1,200 cities and towns worldwide that are advancing practices in local sustainable development that inputs to the Rio Earth Summit and continues to lead local government input to all major UN work. Our second is Zafar Adil, and he's a professor of professional practice at School of Sustainable Energy Engineering 
Simon Fraser University and managing the public, the Pacific Water Research Center. He has worked in the international development and research environment as a United Nations official, leading a network of scientists working in water scarce countries, particularly those in Africa, Middle East and Asia, while at the United Nations University. He also chaired UN Water and co-chairing the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Team that produced a global desertification synthesis in 2005. Jeff, you have three to five minutes. You have the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Hi. Chancellor. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, there's no echo. Thank you very much, Minister Councillor. Um, th the presentations have been very interesting and what I thought I might be able to contribute to the discussion is what the challenge is and um, uh, areas of work would be to move from multi-factor risk assessment, uh, which the speakers have discussed in uh, considerable detail, to what you could call multi-benefit projects or multi-benefit solutions. So in order to understand how this uh, knowledge, which um, I very much appreciate is now being gathered, the assessments are being done with the engagement of a wide diversity of stakeholders at all um, levels of, uh, of, of government and institutions, but also from across a variety of interest groups, including the most vulnerable. This is very important, but how we get from that understanding that can be developed to actually organizing ourselves and changing our institutions in ways that we can deal with the extreme underlying stresses that we're dealing with in addition to the exposures and hazards that are being uh, flagged in the assessment. So to context, um, I don't need to say, but I will, just so we reflect on it. Cities, particularly in the global south, particularly on the African subcontinent, extremely rapid growth in urban and peri-urban areas, growing exposure. So the assessments we do today may actually need to be updated because um, people are settling in highly in informal settlements in particular in highly exposed areas, very limited capacity um, in institutions altogether, um, very limited resources to deal with the threats in particular in the current COVID context and into the recovery from COVID um, and other shock events, uh, insufficient finances. So the international uh, development assistance community, the uh, private investment firms are just beginning to stand up something even akin to the uh, funding uh, streams that are being necessary to deal with the risks that these assessments are identified, um, poorly developed markets. And I'll harp on this one lastly, if that isn't all too overwhelming, very low capacities for project preparation. So once we understand multi-factor risk, and we have to understand how to reduce, mitigate, transfer risk, the complexity of that. We need to move into multi-benefit um, projects that reduce the set of risks, but also deal with those underlying stresses that I just outlined as they express themselves in very limited, in, excuse me, in very particular unique local circumstances where the exposures are unique. Um, and in order to do so, a critical issue that we uh, and 100 Resilient Cities and ICLE and Resilient Cities Catalyst now um, find we have to deal with is the organization of everyone who manages risk in the silos. In fact, we think about risk reduction and mitigation in the same silos that we're organized in. And yours slide, though it wasn't intended um, only to be, a, to be a fully accurate representation of the way the Ghanaian governmental system works, um, you know, with the lines going strictly vertical is very representative of how government is organized and institutions are organized. We've got the health institutions at the different levels and we've got the water resources, flood control, et cetera, et cetera. So when we move from multi-factor exposures to multi-benefit projects, we have to think about how we organize ourselves in teams to bring all of um, those key uh, players together. And your assessments are highlighting that need but now we have to ask ourselves, how do we organize ourselves um, so that we can design projects that are place specific and access and, and structure them in a way um, that we can draw on the resources. And to do so, we need to work increasingly rapidly. And it's a point I will end on and harp on in all of these forms 
to understand what the task is to build capacity capacity locally to actually take this information and design projects and bring one forward to uh, those have have resources for them. Um, I've done some uh, work in Accra. Um, I, I love your city and uh, of course I've worked um, through 100 resilient cities on the, the strategy that uh, uh, Accra municipal um, uh, municipality uh, came up with out of that. We worked on the relationship between traffic uh, risks and hawkers in the streets. Relative to the problems we're dealing with, a simple problem, um, but the conflicts are very rich. And so the only way we came up with a set of solutions is by bringing them together into facilitated design processes and building the capacity of all the stakeholders to understand how each other works and what they need to do to help each other come up with a common solution. A few recommendations in terms of doing that. Engagement of universities. Um, and not just um, the local universities, but inter, uh, university networks. In that project, we had a team of 12 from the University of Pennsylvania and from Princeton University working with local universities in Accra to actually come up um, with design solutions on changing the, um, the intersections in the streets and figuring out where the street vendors could store their goods and many, many detailed things like this they need to be worked out. There's a global network called EPIC, which stands for the Educational Partnership for Innovation and Communities that organizes networks of neighborhoods that can work with you at a city level in order to both do research, but actually apply a group of um, senior degree level students to bring their expertise to bear on very specific local problems. Secondly, develop local communities of practice, in particular with the consultants locally. We're too oriented towards, especially in the bilateral um, uh, development finance world, to, you know, the UK wants the UK specialists, the Americans want the Americans. We need to build up the capacity of local uh, uh, consultant and technical specialists on how they do resilience design and planning and our resources, the international resources should go to build building up those capacities uh, within the, the locality. And Yaw's final slide, sorry, Yao's final slide really indicated who are all the players in that sphere. And then finally, ultimately by working together in order to deal with the extremity of challenges of both exposures, multi-factor risk, and the stresses that make communities very vulnerable uh, to uh, shock events, we need to design institutions within uh, local communities that know how to do this kind of design and planning work and structure these projects in a way that they draw on the full range of resources, governmental monies, local governmental monies, charitable funding, in-kind resources, concessional finance, uh, private um, uh, investments in order to structure them and bring them forward at a scale that we need to, to deal with the kinds of risks that you're um, identifying through your assessment processes. So I'll leave my thoughts at that. I know I threw a lot on the table, but thank you again, Minister Councillor, for this time. Thank you, Jeb. And please, Monica is fine. Monica Boham. So Monica is fine. Thank you. Um, Zafar, you have the floor now and you have um, three to five minutes. Um, before Jafar speaks, can I just um, remind us that if we have any questions, we could put it in the chat so that we can um, ask the uh, panelists and the respondents. You have the floor, Jafar. Thank you very much, Monica. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. I'm very grateful uh, to Felix and others who invited me to be um, engaged in this conversation. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that SFU operates on the traditional and unceded lands of the uh, indigenous uh, uh, First Nations here in, in this part of Canada, the Coast Squamish uh, people. Uh, so it's a great privilege to be on these lands, and you can probably see a glimpse of that in my virtual backdrop behind that. So what I would like to share with you, and my apologies for missing a, a bit of the earlier part of the presentations, uh, but I, I had looked through all of the presentation and I wanted to share some experiences uh, that I've had in leading a project between Canada, Mexico, and the United States where we were uh, looking fairly systematically around uh, floods and their impacts and also the notion of cascading hazards that I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from and hopefully 
the findings that came from that conversation are useful uh, to this particular one. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, at the end of the day, we are moving towards uh, enhanced resilience. And I think the conceptual framing that is being used in, in, the, in the project we're discussing now is the one on the right, where we are saying uh, the, the sort of the three legs of the stool are uh, DR3, SDG framing, and climate change adaptation. Uh, and all of these have to be incorporated at a planning level, at the, at the national level which I think makes very good sense. Uh, but I would argue that when you drop down to the lower level, at the, at the local level, uh, the, these uh, concepts start to become a little bit more distant and also a bit more difficult to translate into actions on, the, uh, on that local scale. And that's why the kind of framing that we've had, uh, particularly with a focus towards uh, responses on the ground, or is a slightly different type of, and I call it action framing. And this is where we need to have improved uh, ability to forecast what the hazards are. And those forecasts have to be locally specific. Uh, we need to have the ability to respond in a timely way. Uh, and that means the local emergency responders uh, become a, a key part of the, the overall response mechanism. And thirdly, we need to have resilient communities, uh, and I'll speak about uh, how we get to that level of resilience in a moment. So these two are not mutually contradictory, uh, contradictory flame, uh, framings, but they are actually uh, speaking to different aspects of how enhanced resilience can be built. So some of the approaches that we have uh, stumbled upon uh, over the course of last, three years or so of looking at uh, North America, uh, that incorporation of uh, flood costing methodology is critical for planning of uh, resilience at the, at the community level. And that means uh, we have to, uh, on the one side, connect upwards to policies at the federal, state, uh, and provincial level. You really have to connect at the municipal level. And what we found, which was quite incredible, that the data dissonance from different sources of what kind of damage and impact was taking place was quite immense. And it was actually much worse in US and Canada than it was in Mexico. Uh, and we need to reduce that data dissonance, is, is the way I phrase it, uh, to be able to actually understand what's, what's actually happening. Uh, we also need to have the appropriate communities and regions use the data which is suitable to their uh, particular purposes. And that means uh, that data and tools need to support decision making processes related to flood management primarily, uh, but to other hazards as well. Uh, and, and you know that needs to connect local and national levels uh, through these tools. Next one, please. Uh, and the third part is that we found, uh, again, this was quite prominent and it's perhaps a little bit ironic that uh, in US and Canada, uh, the capacity of local uh, level uh, planners and emergency responders uh, was, was the worst in, in US and Canada in terms of being able to uh, incorporate information about uh, these adverse impacts into uh, preparedness for uh, for future impacts and emergency responses for when the floods took place. So next slide, please. Oops, sorry, too fast. <laughs> um, so here are some comments uh, to leave you with in terms of uh, what we found from our project and which I think are applicable to, to this uh, particular case. So in order to enhance resilience and to come up with uh, consolidated responses that also uh, help with climate change adaptation and work towards SDG uh, implementation, we need to have centralized and uh, standardized economic uh, impact data. And, and I say that uh, with, uh, with, with a sense of, uh, uh, I, I can say to some level disappointment uh, in uh, again, Canada and US that the comprehensiveness of information is simply not there at the moment where we should be able to look at 
what was happening uh, in various economic sectors to agriculture, for example, or to transportation. Uh, and so there's a need for creating mechanisms that can provide real-time provisioning of economic impact data. Uh, you need to engage for, uh, you know, first responders as well as long-term strategic planners at different levels of government so that they, they can actually use these data to, uh, to uh, arrive at their investment decisions at the end of the day. And obviously here in North America, there is an interest in um, analyzing what the continental scale patterns and trends are as well. Uh, we need to investigate methods for interlinking economic impacts for what we call cascading hazards. And here in British Columbia, where I'm located, there's lots of examples of how wildfires have uh, uh, resulted in uh, extreme floods or landslides. Uh, similarly, we've had droughts followed by wildfires followed by floods. And so instead of looking at floods as isolated events, you have to look at the larger picture and connect with other hazards. And uh, finally, uh, we need to uh, connect the these flood costing data to flood risk maps. So again, you can look at the larger strategic picture. Finally, uh, I think in the slides I only saw in, in Ghana, there was a linkage between uh, the insurance sector as part of the stakeholders. And, and we think that they are a fairly critical player, both in terms of, holder of holders of data, but also in uh, providing tools to communities to respond to and, and uh, emerge from uh, flood related disasters. So let me stop here and uh, give the floor back to Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Zafar. Um, so um, I see that there's been a lot of um, communication in the chat. Um, I realize that um, Kristen has answered a question about the involvement of, of um, stakeholders from um, the disability community and um, organizations on persons with disabilities the fact that they were not um, really involved in the, um, the research that was done. And there, I believe there's going to be um, further discussion on that, um, maybe um, as we go along, uh, um, you know. So uh, I know I'll, I would also like to acknowledge um, Mason's um, comments for, um, for providing the valuable information on the UNEP work. I think it would be helpful and, um, so I think we can all look in the chat for further um, information for your own um, self. So um, I see that apart from that, we have a question for Dr. Boafo. Um, so Dr. Boafo, has there been any substantial foreign sponsored projects relating to the water drainage systems in which may aid or alleviate risk of flooding. In relation to this, has there been any improper planning? So I have two questions for you, Dr. Boafu, if you could quickly bring the answer. All right, thank you. So very quickly, I'm, I'm aware of, um, you know, a project supported by the World Bank, you know, known as the the Greater Accra Metropolitan Area Sanitation and and Water Project. You know that that project, I think, it's 2017, aimed at the providing funds for the construction of road covered drains in certain parts of the city, mainly Kaneshi area. You know, moving down to the Accra Metropolitan Central, and these are some of the most prone areas to flooding annually. So, and that project, I think. Has been ongoing. It's not something that is completed, you know. But I, I know I'm aware that that project has been in the in the offing for some time because, you know, because most of our gutters, our open gutters, they tend to get choked. You know, immediately there's rain with all kinds of waste from different parts of the city. But I guess the idea of that project was that you know proper drainage and coverage to avoid that situation. So that's uh, maybe the first part of the question. And then uh, the second part is interested in the 2015 Accra flood, definitely action. So I'll say that the you know, institutional action at the municipal level or at the metropolitan level, 
you know, there's been efforts by the Metropolitan Assembly to, you know, what would I call eject people who are building in waterways or, you know, and enforce the law. Actually, the laws are there, but to enforce it, or people who are selling or who are putting stretches in different waterways. And those laws, when they are enforced, obviously helps to, you know, deal with the annual flooding. So, for instance, you know, this year, like I had said earlier, you know, typically June, we've had a few rains and we didn't really have, you know, major flooding concerns. Also because, you know, the new regional minister for Accra has taken up, you know, a task of ensuring that, you know, people, including residential, commercial, individuals who are, you know, living in areas that are, you know, supposed to be, you know, waterways and also that are not are all, you know, moved. So it has also helped. And there's also a tree planting going on in different parts of the city to ensure that they also help deal with some of the, you know, issues associated with the flooding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yao. I see we have a number of questions coming up at the last minute. Um, so even though we are almost out of time, I'll just like us to briefly look at them. So there's this one for DR3 purposes. Are there resilience and adaptation or are these 10 stakeholder context site specific? I think any of the panelists can answer or responded can answer this. If Christine, could you? Sure. Um, I think I'm a little bit newer on my. Yeah. I'm a little newer on the project, so um, if Catalina wants to jump in, um, but I believe we're. Um, operating um, somewhat dependent, independently and so have different definitions, but we're also going to be consolidating a lot of our work next year. So we're, um, I think we're working with kind of both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think, oh, if Catalina, you'd like to come in here briefly? Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> I was just going away um, for a moment. Uh, yes, we do create a dictionary of terms. Um, we are well aware, aware of all these uh, standard terms and so on, so we can share if anyone is interested in so on, just to contact us and then we can share the, the terms and the different definitions we are using in our uh, uh, project. Do bear in mind that we are an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team. So even for us to have the same language takes time to, to compile and to talk because sometimes uh, indicators, for example, in a field could mean completely different in another field. And, and the same with many other uh, terms we have here. So yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We had another question there. Yes. The standardized impact data is key in my view. What are the concrete measures that would encourage collection of such data? Absolutely. So we, we do this. So we create data repositories uh, for all the data collections. We have a very wide range of data because we collect data from stakeholders. We have data from social media. We have uh, various other data um, for the models and so on. So you can imagine the amount of data we have. But definitely we, we, um, we uh, invest a lot of time on uh, centralizing uh, all these uh, data collections and we create uh, the purpose is to create a, a meta database uh, which will make available uh, on our platform uh, once it's uh, it's done and finished thank you very much catalina and i'd like to thank all of you um i'd like to give you um 30 seconds to just say one thing that you'd like to stick with us so whoever um uh, maybe um catalina if you'd like to start one thing that you'd like to stick with us in briefly, 30 seconds. In 30 seconds is uh, a collaboration. It's absolutely key and crucial in this type of uh, projects. Uh, creating partnerships. We are always looking for new partnerships to create and uh, um, stakeholders engagement and uh, local 
involvement is absolutely crucial in at this stage and uh, especially like uh, Zafar mentioned um, about uh, the comments on actions. Yes, we do. We are going to run a number of uh, a series of workshops uh, for islands and coastal cities in uh, September, October this year. Uh, so if you are interested, please do engage with us. Uh, it's absolutely in, uh, important and <laughs> mandatory to Venice to work with locals to understand uh, what is happening at the local level and um, to to adapt the methods, but you need the methods first. So without the methods, you don't really can do much to be honest in practice as well. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just support what Catalina is saying and, and, and uh, as a reminder to myself and all how important listening is and, and adopting a posture of um, humility, I think, in, in going about this work and um, to be able to learn from others who are who um, are more familiar, whether they're being impacted or have been long into this work. And so, um, yeah, that's... Thank you. Malta, if she's still with me, if she's not available, it's okay. Um, I am. Oh, Malta, you're here. Great, great. Yes. 30 seconds. Yeah. 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 For me, for me, I see that there is a very important need to identify the informal structure within communities. There are formal structures, but there are also effective informal structures which can add value and can reach the community more effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Yao? We cannot hear you. Could you unmute yourself, please? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. So I just like to say that for the project that we are running, you know, it will, it will not be the outcome will not be useful without the critical stakeholders like you know government sector stakeholders. At the, because at the day, you know, they are critical for decision making, policy making. So we are urging them to get on board and provide us with the necessary support when it comes to data, when it comes to engagement, so that we can get excellent data to work with going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Zafar. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, two points I would like to leave you with is that what we've discovered is that the kind of challenges that you encounter in developing countries are actually not unique. And we're seeing the same challenges popping up in developed countries as well. So there is a lot of room for collaboration. And I really like the idea of getting universities engaged in, in that process. And secondly, I think uh, for uh, getting communities on board, you have to get them excited about positive changes and, and solutions. And I think just focusing on the doom and gloom and the negative stories actually um, leads to opposite outcomes. And, and I think we, we need to focus on and define uh, success stories and, and share those widely so that uh, people can see that, yes, there's a way uh, forward as well. Thank you, Zafar. Jeff? Yeah, the last um, following on uh, Zafar's comment to address the scale of the doom and gloom that we're confronting, um, I think we have to seriously move beyond uh, partnerships and stakeholder engagement to developing a whole new layer of institutions that are specialized in addressing the complexity and scale of the problems that we're addressing in the face of climate change and the weak capacities as again I referred to Zafar's point that we find even in the United States and Canada. So we've done this at the local level on many other problems, brownfields redevelopment, establishment of new utilities based on new technologies. We need to create an institutional fabric that allows us to interface with all the complexity and all the scales required to address the urgency of the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of all the organizers, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the panelists and the respondents and all attendees of this um, side event. And I'd like to wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. <laughs>